Alrighty. So, verses 21 and 22. These both dovetail right in together, so I kind of grouped them up. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. This is what Jesus taught the believers should do to their enemies. Be good to those who persecute you. Our reward is not for this world, Jesus said over and over. The best way to destroy an enemy is to make a friend of him, and this can only be done by being kind to him. Spite is not the motive for doing good to enemies, but rather the hope that it will be the means of humbling him and bringing him to repentance for his evil toward us. In any case, if we have the right attitude, the Lord's blessings will be on us, whatever the response of our enemy. This is a definite thing. Those to whom we have done good may pretend that we are not affected, but it will have its results. And whatever they may be, the Lord is committed to reward us for it. Right? I mean, I'm sure we all have different stories of this. What's that? Um, and even you say, hopefully we plant the seed, right? And you might never, ever see that seed come to fruition. But at least as long as we know that we did the right thing in the situation, that we just stand firm knowing that it's going to produce one way or another, even though we might not, not ever see it. But it's what we're called to do, right? <clears throat> All right. Uh, verse 23. The north wind driveth away rain, so doth an angry countenance a backbiting tongue. So first of all, just to clarify a couple of definitions, uh, slandering is to make a false spoken statement that causes people to have a bad opinion of someone. And the definition of backbiting, to say mean or spiteful things as, to, as one not present, or things about as if someone wasn't present. Uh, the theme here, oops. The theme here is one of cause and effect. As surely as a north wind drives away a rain cloud, so will then an angry look sometimes stop a person from saying slanderous things about someone else. So if one shows that he rejects and scorns slanders of others, he will halt the spreader of gossip. Open ears always encourage open mouths. Backbiters would not have place if there were no ears itching to hear their tales. We must discourage sin and witness against it, and in particular, the sin of slandering and backbiting. Right? I mean, how many times do we find ourselves in a situation where someone's talking about someone else or whatever, and you start to get that uncomfortable feeling, right? You know it's going in a direction it probably shouldn't be. <clears throat> so we have to stand up to that, right? But it's not always easy. It might be a family member. It might be a good friend. Um, but the, the, the true show of friendship or family would be to rise up in that situation and stop them, right? But then you have these other things like, oh, what's it going to make them feel like? Or what are my emotions going to be? Or, or what's going to happen? Am I going to break that friendship? It's, it can be a tough situation. But again, that's, that's what we are called as Christians to do. Um, but it's easier to say it sometimes than, it, than when you're in the moment. But that's, uh, that's the command that we are to follow. All right. So verse 24, and if anyone has any, anything at any point, just feel free to, to chime in. I'm, to, to feel free to interrupt. It is better to dwell. We're going to try not to get too hung up on this one, to be perfectly honest with you. But yeah. uh, It is better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. I know. I know. Obviously, this is man and woman. I'll just put that out there. I have a word of wisdom for all the husbands. Never quote this verse out loud. Mm -hmm. when keep, the wife keep it inside. Is yeah. yeah. <clears throat> 
So a brawling woman is literally a woman of contentions. The plural, plural contentions suggesting a continual aspect of it, right? So it's, it's always, always, always there. A woman or a man, for that matter, can make a home a heaven or a hell, depending on his or her nature. We see here what makes a home is not the size of the house, but it is the peace and the rest there. To live with an angry, brawling, fighting person, man or woman, is very miserable. Uh, and one kind of spin-off of this. Uh, so you think back to the roofs in, in the town of Judea at the time. They were flat. So this is basically saying it's better to stay on the rooftop, a flat rooftop, go in the corner of that place when it's scorching heat or thunderstorms or whatever, than be inside a big house with a brawling person, right? Just live it out on the roof. Yeah, pitch your tent, yeah. If you got a yard, stay in the tent, whatever it would be. So I think we'll leave that one there. Uh, verse 25. Um, this one, as many of them, this was kind of straightforward. I didn't have a whole, whole lot on, on this particular one. But verse 25, as cold waters to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. This is a comparison that's very easily understood. Um, when you're hot and thirsty, there's no better drink that money can buy than a cool drink of water, right? Or as we saw earlier in verse 13 of this chapter, a refreshing coolness which helps in the time of harvest. Uh, it is natural for us to desire to hear good news from our friends and concerning our affairs at a distance. Uh, in the Passion Version, it says, so hearing good news revives the spirit. Right? You like to hear good news naturally, right? That's a natural, a natural occurrence. And for people to want to seek us out and have conversation or share good news to each other, that sort of thing, so... Um, so that one was pretty, pretty straightforward, really. Um, verse 26. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain in a corrupt spring. The Passion states it more plainly, saying, When a lover of God gives in and compromises with wickedness, <clears throat> it can be compared to contaminating a stream with sewage or polluting a fountain. That's right. That's right. That's true. Um, this can be taken either of two ways. First, for a righteous man to fall down and give into his convictions so that he no longer rebukes the wicked, but compromises is to become no more a fountain of truth and life. All right, the fountain of truth and life but one that is troubled and corrupt. Second, for a righteous man to fall down and yield to temptation and sin is likewise to be a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. For he sends forth a false and deceptive testimony to those about him. And so he poisons those to whom he should be a fountain of life-giving truth. We neither live nor die unto ourselves, which Romans 14, 7 and 8 says, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. As Christians, we are supposed to stand up for what is right. An attack on a Christian is actually an attack upon our Lord. For a Christian to be degraded by the wicked is like a beautiful spring of water that has been corrupted. Christian's words come from a pure heart, which is sometimes spoken of as a river, right? River, river of life, which, has no, which never has an end. This river from within is pure because it comes from God. We're cruising today. Everyone's quiet, I guess. That's fine. Verse 27. It is not good to eat much honey, so, f so for men to search their own glory is not glory. This verse is similar to verse 16, which was also in this chapter, where the writer is, is advising to eat honey in moderation. For too much of most things will be bad for one. Right? He gave the whole example of Winnie the Pooh, and, you know, it's kind of all or nothing with the honey jar, right? And once he gets it, he's good for nothing because he just goes into a honey coma. He just pounds the whole jar. Uh, here the metaphor is illustrative of the folly of self-glorification. 
A conceited person is not admired by anyone. If you eat too much honey, you will get sick at your stomach. If you brag on yourself, others will get sick at their stomach. Right? That's kind of interesting, right? Mm. I can see, uh, I'll read it again. If you eat too much honey, you will get sick at your stomach. If you brag on yourself, others will get sick at their stomach. Yeah. Eating honey here is, an, is analogous to enjoying the sweetness of your own self-glory. Glory follows him that seeks it not. To be humble when glory unsought comes to us and to attribute all glory to God is our wisdom. Acts 12.23 gives us a warning. And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, because he gave not the glory, God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and given up the ghost. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercised loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. In Galatians 6 and 14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. These verses show only the legitimate glorifying that we can glory in. So, well, yeah, go ahead. I, I think if we go a little further with honey, Remember the story about Jonathan, and uh, he stuck his sword down into the lion and found honey, and it says it enlightened his eye. And the picture always with honey is the fact, especially here, is that it's enlightenment, it's more knowledge, it's, it's knowing something. And uh, the Bible says that knowledge puffeth up. And if you follow the whole process of this verse, you begin to realize the minute a man gets knowledge, he begins to think that he's better because he has the knowledge. It's, it's self-gain, it's self-glory. And again, I'm going back to uh, my favorite phrase from Miss Clarice. Knowledge of a matter does not guarantee possession of a matter. You might know, but between knowing and walking it out is two different things. It's like getting the baptism of the Holy Ghost and talking in tongues and then never walking in the Spirit. That's it. It's, a, it's, it's an issue of ego. It's an issue of, of lording your mindset one above another. It's, it's, it's unchristian. But at the same time, God wants us to eat honey. We're not, that was their sweetener. That was their, you know, if, if, if all you ever, I remember when we went to Kenya, they don't, they don't eat hardly anything sweet. But they do like sweet. They love honey. But uh, I, I'm not into eating termites. But when I ask him about what they taste like, he said they were bitter. And they and, and can you imagine they eat rice and beans all the time? Uh, you know, rice and beans are good, but there, there's no sweetness to them, and very little sweetness. So that you got to have a little honey in your life, okay? It, it, go home and try to talk tough talk to your wife all the time, and see 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 if a little honey don't help. You know, it works, and and I think that this is the picture. But at the same time, you can you can honey too much. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that. You said on Thursday night that um, that the knowledge, you know, knowledge of a matter doesn't mean you actually know what it is. And I think about that kind of in the practical too, right? Even I think kind of in in, in my job, you know, we like to think a lot of times, like for me, in an estimator role, we have to actually determine 
how many labor hours it's going to take to produce a product. Mm -hmm. So, but if you have no experience actually producing that product, how can you actually know what it really takes? You know, there's metrics or there's things out there. You can say there's co labor costs and that sort of thing. But until you've actually physically done it, and then the same token, how, how can someone fully respect what you say or believe what you say if you can't back it up by saying you've actually done it, right? You know? Yeah, I always say it's called estimating, not exacting, right? If you're an exactor, you're probably making a lot more money, right? Yeah, right. Yep. Right. But there's, yeah, so it's, you know, right, exactly. You can read all the directions and that sort of thing, but until you've actually done it, you don't really know if you don't have the hands on. That's what the pipe fitters go for all the pipes an electrician goes. Right, I know. Electricians always got to go first. They always got to go first. I know the AC guys always got to go first. <laughs> But, I mean, that's how many, I mean, really, if you think about it, how, do, you, do you really honestly respect someone's opinion or what they're saying if, if they haven't actually done it? Right. You know? It's like, <laughs> I suppose this could be a can of worms, but it's like someone who's observing a parent for the first time with their children, right. and they want to put in their own comments, but if they don't have kids of their own, yeah. how can they fully right. understand that, right? Right? right. right? Yeah. Yeah. My kids are not going to do that. Right. Never, never, no, nope, never. We've all been there, right? I've been on both sides of it too, so pointing the finger at myself. <clears throat> all right, uh, verse 28, <clears throat> final verse. He hath no rule over his own spirit as like a city that is broken down and without walls. The Passion says it quite well in its version. If you live without restraint and are unable to control your temper, you are as helpless as a city without broken down with broken down defenses, yeah. open to attack. Oops. Right. Um. Before modern weapons, most ancient cities relied upon high, thick walls for defense. The Great Wall of China was built to keep out invaders. Yeah. Yet, of the several times it was breached, None of them were because of the wall being broken down. All, the result, all were the result of betrayers within the walls. <clears throat> he has no control over his own spirit, whether it has to do with pride, like in verse 27, lust, anger, or whatever, has a betrayer within to overthrow the city of his soul. Prayer for, prayerful, watchful self-control is the wall of the city, and we should see to it that there is no breach made in in it by self-reliance or spiritual laziness. Many a man has destroyed himself after others have failed to have much influence over him to destroy him. In truth, man is often his own worst enemy. A city without a wall is in peril. It has no protection. A man's spirit is what he is. If he loses control of the spirit, he has lost control of himself. The spirit of a man must control the flesh or else the man will go way of the flesh. Such are exposed and vulnerable to the incursion of evil thoughts and successful temptations which lead them to hell. Um, if you think about that, right, there's probably plenty of movies and things out there too where it, it was always, it was someone inside the walls, right? Someone within the group yeah. that led to the demise or the, something happening that became the downfall. So you could think that everything... You could think that everything is great on the outside, or your perimeter is all set up. So that's going to keep what you think is going on on the outside of the world or whatnot outside. But what's going on within? You know, are, do you actually have your temperature on what's going on within to know what's? Is that what's going to backfire? Is that what's going to come back to get you? So trying to keep that the pulse on that, and uh, I suppose you could even think of it within your own families, right? You can. You can put up the fences. You can do all this stuff for the world outside. Mm -hmm. But how are you actually reacting within your own family, within your own home, right? Sure. You have to take your pulse on that. Yeah. Um, sure. So you think that everything's put up and in place. Um, but if you're not totally in tune with, with your own family and what's going on, um, then yeah. it, it can be, you know. And it's hard to see, right? We have the blinders on sometimes. Um, we don't want to think, oh, you know, everything's going fine inside. It's, it's that world outside that's, that's so terrible. Um, but if we're not keeping our pulse 
on what's going on. Right. And with our kids, right? And I, my kids are still young enough. Sure, they're, they're quite influential, but they're not out there as much to know um, what's going on, right? I think even my kids were watching a movie, Goofy movie, and the dad, the kid was, ended up in the principal's office, right? Because he was just acting up. And uh, he wanted to get attention from a girl and that sort of thing. So he had to do this big charade to get her attention. And he got busted, ended up in the principal's office. And so the principal had to call the dad and say, oh, your son's going to end up in jail or in the electric chair for this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's a kid's movie, so you've got to go extreme. Um, but so then the, dad's, the dad wanted to, he said, all right, we've got to go on a vacation. We're going to go take a vacation. Cause, cause he, well, because he wanted to get in touch with his son, right? He realized he had lost touch with his son. And, you know, in the end, it's all happy, and they get, get together, and, you know, everything's all jolly and good. But he had, he had lost sight of the fact that his son was going down a different road. He was just too busy doing his own thing. And, you know, that, that was kind of the result. Granted, it's just a cartoon, so the principal's office, you know, you could take that and put that into a bigger context. But the point is just within, the walls, the walls within. Um, and we take that in our lives, you could take that in this body, we could take that, uh, you could even take that within your workplace probably, right? You have sabotage or something like that going on. Um, Got to be careful of, of that sort of thing too. Right, well you think about that, or someone takes trade secrets and goes out, you know, nowadays you end up in jail for that sort of thing, but it could be, could be the demise of a workplace. We could get our political rants, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um. uh, here's another verse. Yep. That is just the opposite of this. Mm -hmm. It's uh, sixteen thirty-two. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh take the city. So it's just the opposite of what this verse says. Mm -hmm. It talks about being able to rule your spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there are so many parallels, you know, like many of these verses are referred to in many other locations throughout the Bible, right? So it's not like they're only used once. So they're trying to drive home a point when they're used in different ways. Or there's, yeah, there's the contrary to, to think about as well. Um, so that, that's pretty much what I had, really. I mean, you know, I kind of breezed through it this week. Um, but really, when you think about, you know, you think about the Proverbs in general, right? It's just, it's practical living for us, right? It should be. I mean, most of the verses, they're, they are pretty straightforward. Yeah. It's just a matter of applying them to our lives, right? Yeah. So it's good to have that constant reminder. Yeah. It's good to go through these, uh, go through each chapter like we've been doing, which is, which is good. Um, then it's a matter of living it out outside of, outside of these doors, Absolutely. which is the hard part. But. So that's it. Yeah, I don't know who, uh, do you know who's next chapter? All right, next week they'll be up. Oh, oh another fill-in. <laughs> Perfect. All right. <laughs>